had gold-plated bones. The great Lafayette had a Latin phrase uh, that was on his door that said, the more I know of people, the more I love my dog. In 1911, Lafayette comes to Edinburgh. They book the Empire Theatre, biggest theatre in the land, for two weeks. It sells out. It looks like a very, very good week for Lafayette, except that this is the week that Beauty, his beloved mongrel, dies. Lafayette has uh, Beauty buried in Pierce Hill Cemetery, just east of the city centre, where it's allowed that the pets can be buried there, providing the owner promises to be buried in the same spot when he or she dies. This turns out to be quite fortuitous because just two days later, Lafayette is to join Beauty. Lafayette goes on stage in Edinburgh and a fire starts. The fire spreads very quickly. The stage curtain goes down, the public get out, no problem. Unfortunately, backstage, the people are trapped because the doors have been locked. They've been locked to protect Lafayette's secrets from the public and from competitors. As a result, Lafayette burns to death. But if Lafayette was hated by other magicians, he was adored by his public. Lafayette's funeral in Edinburgh is absolutely enormous. There's almost a quarter of a million people lining the streets to witness what's happened. This has been a, a national tragedy. They've lost a hugely famous international entertainer. The great Lafayette was one of many magicians to use Eastern design and costumes to add mystery and exoticism to their shows. The British Empire stretched over a, a fifth of the, the world's surface. So a lot of people were coming back with stories about India and China and so on. So naturally, the entertainment took on this aspect. It, it was natural to dress yourself up and, uh, as, as a Chinese or, or Indian or something from the, the exotic East uh, because it, 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 it made an impression. Orientalism became a theme in all sorts of arts, the visual arts, the decorative arts, and in poetry, you know, Coleridge's Kubla Khan, with its stately pleasure domes. And I think this word pleasure is very important in terms of the way in which the West saw the East. Magicians were very clever in taking up the images of the exotic East. These images were very much to do with sex. When you saw Maharaja or a Sultan, instantly you thought of harems, of brides, of slave girls. There was always this subtext of, of some illicit sexual relations. And so much the better if the magician had a, a pretty assistant who was kitted out in diaphanous veils. Magicians love exotic costumes, exotic sets and props, and they're always borrowing from other cultures. Anything that's foreign is fascinating. In many traditions, the person with the biggest hat is in charge. You know, the person with the, the most amount of juju, they call it, you know, the, the most amount of trappings and, uh, and uh, regalia. And this stands true in ceremonial lodges of secret societies and fraternities these days. Uh, even in religious societies around the world, I mean, the pope is in charge, he wears the biggest hat. Magicians during the Golden Age were emissaries, as it were, from another world. Wherever you happen to be, it was important that they come from somewhere else to be bringing you allegedly forbidden wisdom. So if you were, say, in a small town in Kansas and someone came and had a sphinx on stage, it would delight you in a way. It was something exotic and unusual. And it also elevated the magician in a way because he knew something you didn't and was going to let you into a mystery a little bit. And there's something about that that's quite seductive.
But if proof was ever needed as to the potency of the Oriental myth, there was one magician, Xiong Ling Su, who went so far down that route, he actually changed his identity and became Chinese. He gave interviews in gibberish that a translator would translate to English. Uh, he had his wife uh, put on makeup to look like she was Chinese too. And uh, this was uh, something that he continued all the way until he died. It was actually a surprise to most people after his death that he had not actually been Chinese. When Chung Ling Su died on stage in 1918, performing the dangerous bullet catch illusion, the world was amazed to find that his real name was Billy Robinson, a New Yorker who'd never even been to China. Billy Robinson was a mechanic for the Keller Show, but he wanted to be a magician, and he realized that there was a great interest in the Orient, so he became Chinese. I mean, he bought Chinese costumes, he did Chinese style tricks, and the reports have it that he did the Chinese tricks better than the Chinese. Of course, the Chung Ming Su show was, was a big show, and they did this twice nightly. Now, in those days, of course, there were, there were enough theatres to go around and, and go forever. In London, there were, there were something like 50 theatres, which you could you'd go around and, and appear one week at each show. You, you, you had your whole career uh, sort of mapped out for you. However, in 1908, he began to become a little apprehensive about this deception he was playing. Boxer Rebellion was happening in China, and news began to filter through to the rest of the atrocities that were being committed. And he agreed to an interview with a Liverpool theatrical paper in which he conceded his true parentage. But nobody took any notice. This recently rediscovered footage is thought to be the only film record of Chung Ling Su that exists today. He's seen greeting World War I veterans at a 1915 benefit performance. No one was a greater master of the theatrical magic poster than Chung Ling Su. He probably had more printed on his behalf than any other illusionist. Posters and playbills were, in effect, music videos, commercials, and PR materials all rolled in the ones. They were the electronic press kits of the turn of the century. You might not know exactly what was coming to town when you saw a poster of the devil, but you knew it was something. Magicians had to constantly outdo each other about who had the most spectacular posters. The sensuality of such Eastern exotica was still being exploited in the 1930s by Fu Manchu, the stage name of Westerner David Bamberg, who was descended from a dynasty of European magicians dating back to the 17th century. In the dying days of the Golden Age, Fu Manchu's stage shows were the inspiration for Cesario Palaez, who's been a magician for over 40 years. I was four and a half, and I was living in Cuba. The paper have dedicated a full center for in photographic things to a so-called magic show called The Magic of Fu Manchu. At this moment, I'm talking about 1937. So my father said, I'll take you tonight to see it. The moment that the show began, I got totally in awe. 